Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison. I want to welcome you to this session of Humanity Rising as we convene day three of a five-day program on the conflict of Ukraine. As we've said uh, many times, the conflict in Ukraine has brought the world to the most dangerous moment in our lifetime, possibly, uh, certainly, since the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, as uh, two of the world's superpowers, the United States and Russia, uh, square off, each heavily armed with nuclear weapons, and each now engaged in Ukraine in a military uh, confrontation uh, that could escalate uh, uncontrollably uh, with either a mistake or a unintended consequence uh, of a planned escalation. At the heart of the Ukrainian conflict is what I've said uh, in the various uh, teachings that I've done is the irresistible force of U.S. NATO expansion uh, is meeting the immovable object of Russian uh, nationalism. And therein lies of uh, the contradiction, and therein lies the possibility of an uncontrolled uh, escalation. There's been a lot of focus on uh, the Russians and the Russian invasions and the motivations. Uh, today, we want to examine the nature and scope of U.S. imperialism. Because at the heart of the conflict in Ukraine is the reality that beginning uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the rise of the neoconservatives in the United States, uh, the United States has conducted uh, military operations around the world and began the process uh, under President Clinton of aggressively expanding NATO uh, to the east in violation of the agreement with President Gorbachev, on the basis of which uh, the Soviet Union withdrew from Eastern Europe uh, and uh, was thereby left vulnerable, uh, given the fact that the United States filled that vacuum uh, with the NATO uh, alliance. And in Ukraine, uh, Russia has finally uh, responded. And to help us understand this more deeply, we're going to be listening to one of the, I would say, one of the great public intellectuals of our time, uh, Chris Hedges, uh, who we'll introduce in a moment. Uh, but for now, let us just pause as we always do as we begin our sessions on Humanity Rising and simply breathe together in a conscious and coherent way. In a world of escalating chaos and escalating turbulence, the most important thing that we can do is cultivate coherence internally and cultivate coherence in our social relationships in our communities, because those are the bulk work that we need to rely on in order to maintain our inner and communal equilibrium so that we can navigate through an increasingly chaotic world. So in a moment, you're gonna hear the sound of a bell. When you hear that bell, just breathe in slowly. You'll hear then the sound of another bell and breathe out. We're gonna take 10 breaths together and then we'll begin our program. Thank you, everyone. Welcome to Humanity Rising. 
you, everyone. It's always so good to breathe as one as we contemplate these very deep issues affecting the future of human civilization itself. Now it's my pleasure to invite back in Jody Evans, uh, who is the co-moderator for our summits on Ukraine. She's the co-founder of Code Pink, which I would say is probably the most dynamic and important peace organizations out there uh, who has been working uh, tirelessly over many decades. So Jody uh, Evans is one of the exemplars par excellence of what it means to be an activist in our world. So Jody, uh, thank you so much for everything you've done to build this uh, second summit uh, for Humanity Rising. And I turn the program over to you to introduce uh, Chris Edges. Thank you so much, Jim, and good morning, everyone. And thank you again for your concern for peace and for joining us. And this is really a treat. Um, I too, with Jim, I'm excited to have Chris with us. First, I wanna read um, a, a tweet that um, just came out from the meeting that uh, President Xi had with Zelensky. And as a peace activist, I'm always trying to figure out how to articulate around um, accountability, that so much is happening and there's no, there's no accountability. And I'm hoping to talk about, to Chris about that later, but um, how uh, a sentence uh, can capture what we're not, what the media and, and, and the light we're not really shining on US engagement um, in Ukraine. And um, she said to Zelensky, as a UN Security Council permanent member and a responsible power, we will neither watch the fire from the shore nor add fuel to the fire, let alone take advantage of the opportunity to make profits. So um, <laughs> that's what you can do, um, you know, instead of dropping a bomb. So, uh, Chris, I invite you to um, turn on your camera and uh, unmute while I introduce you. Chris Hedges has had a huge life as a journalist who covered war in the Middle East and the Balkans, reported from Central America, studied Arabic, won a Pulitzer Prize, was nominated for the National Book Critics Circle Award for Nonfiction, received the Amnesty International Global Award for Human Rights Journalism, hosted a television show for six years, wrote a weekly column for 16 years, spent a decade teaching writing classes in prison in New Jersey, is a Presbyterian minister, and speaks across the country. He is the preeminent public intellectual who I turn to each week for wisdom and guidance and really to nourish my heart and soul. You can read him now on Substack at the Chris Hedges Report or watch his show on The Real News or read him at the Share Post. Um, or sign, just sign up to Substack and you'll get it all. <laughs> so besides being a brilliant writer, he has looked through the darkness and is not frightened by it. He knows the dark side of this country and doesn't avoid it. If you are willing to hear the truth, he is sharing it. I love him most for his passion for peace and the deep understanding of the cost of war. Chris, thank you so much for joining us today on day three of the summit. We began this week talking about citizen, talking with citizen diplomats, Matt, and yesterday we heard from Adia Benjamin. And one of the issues that keeps coming up is the intensity of the propaganda that we're drowning in. Uh, this is your world, the world of journalism. I thought maybe if we could start there with um, helping the audience understand the deafening propaganda and the effects it has on our capacity to understand what is really happening. Thanks, and thanks for having me, Jody. Um, yes, uh, <clears throat> it's very hard to break through that propaganda. These are essentially what Noam Chomsky called the repetition of thought terminating cliches. I think that's a Chomsky quote. Um, and, uh, and they pound it into you from across the uh, spectrum of the media, whether left or right. 
Uh, and that is, of course, uh, it's nothing new. I've covered proxy wars all over uh, the globe, starting in Central America in the early uh, 1980s with uh, El Salvador, Guatemala, and then, of course, the Reagan administration at the time was supporting the Contras, described as freedom fighters. Um, the, we forget the Taliban or the, the, the Mujahideen who morphed into the Taliban were embraced by the Reagan administration as freedom fighters. So what we're watching in Ukraine is a classic kind of proxy war. Most people know very little about Ukraine, and uh, they're not going to find out much about Ukraine uh, from the media. It's it's this kind of mantra, uh, and I'm not in any way excusing the invasion of Ukraine under uh, you know Nuremberg laws, post Nuremberg laws. It's a criminal act of aggression. Uh, but even to discuss the fact that uh, Russia was baited and provoked into that war, which is a fact, and I covered the revolutions in uh, Eastern Europe. I was in East Germany, Czechoslovakia, and Romania at the time, uh, was acutely aware of the promises, as you mentioned, that have been made to Gorbachev not to expand NATO beyond the borders of a unified Germany. Uh, and then you know, there were constant uh, calls by Russia uh, not to continue this advance up to Russian borders. In Clinton administration, there was a promise made not to station NATO troops in Eastern and Central Europe. That's now violated. I think there's 100,000 troops now. Um, and it was ignored for two reasons, because uh, one, uh, the Russian Federation was uh, written off as so weak uh, that uh, the U.S. could do whatever it wanted. That's we had all that rhetoric of a unipolar world. And then also there were billions and billions of dollars to be made by refitting these countries with NATO-compatible equipment. Well, that backstory is never discussed. And then, of course, the coup in 2014, the civil war that ensued. I mean, all of this is nothing is put into context. Uh, and any attempt to put it into context, then immediately there, with the bifurcation uh, which is perpetuated by the media and the political establishment, you immediately become an agent or an apologist for Russia and Putin, which I am not. I don't think anyone here is. Uh, so there's no nuance. There's nothing contextualized. I covered the Middle East for seven years, the Israel-Palestine conflict. Again, nothing was ever contextualized. Uh, you may talk about refugees in Gaza or refugees in camps in Lebanon or Jordan, uh, but I think very few uh, readers or listeners understood uh, the root of the conflict going back to 1948 and the massive ethnic cleansing and massacres that were carried out by what would become the IDF, the Haganah, primarily, uh, uh, against the Palestinians. So uh, that's the first problem in, the, in that there's no context. And secondly, uh, we have to acknowledge that the commercial media is bought and paid for. Uh, by large corporations, including the arms industry. Uh, so that's why all of the pundits, <coughs> and, excuse me, and experts that you see on cable news are drawn from the military and intelligence establishment. And then, of course, most of these people sit on boards. Lloyd Austin was sitting on the board of Raytheon, pulling down hundreds of uh, thousands of dollars, if not more. So uh, it, it's, and in some cases, General Electric used to own uh, uh, MSNBC. I mean, uh, I think Comcast owns it now. But the, the, the there's a there behind the scenes. These people are uh, very uh, uh, ruthless about determining who can speak and who can't, and what message will get across and what can't. So the American public is very ill served uh, by the trivialization of the media and and by the fact that the commercial media is virtually captive to these large commercial interests, which of course. Uh, give them money in terms of ad revenue. Uh, so it's, it's, it's extremely difficult to speak intelligently about what is happening. Um, of course, having spent many years covering proxy conflicts, uh, I'm acutely aware of how Ukraine fits perfectly into this pattern. The conflict in Ukraine, of course, has nothing to do, as the press will tell us, about defending democracy and freedom. Ukraine was long uh, considered the most corrupt country in Europe. Uh, but it's about, of course, furthering U.S. interests uh, by weakening Putin, uh, potentially, excuse me, they have terrible pollen here, um, 
uh, a potentially uh, <coughs> um, excuse me, potentially uh, driving Putin from power and, of course, isolating Putin from Europe and degrading the Russian army. Those are the three primary goals of Washington. Uh, I, I uh, watched them carry out, it, it, and it's a very cynical policy because, of course, it's going to destroy most of Ukraine and, and it's Ukrainian blood that's going to be spilled. Uh, this was true in the war in El Salvador, was true with the, in the Nicaraguan war, was true in the war in Guatemala. Uh, it was, I covered the Kurds. I mean, there is a kind of classic uh, example uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, of betrayal. That's ultimately what happens. Uh, those uh, supported in proxy wars have uh, usually very little chance of victory. The, the Contras certainly had no chance of victory in Nicaragua against the Sandinistas. Um, uh, but, and, and in many cases, you don't want them to have uh, victory. So that was exactly the case that uh, took place with the Kurds in northern Iraq. The Nixon administration uh, uh, in 1972 were, were providing millions of dollars of weapons and ammunition to the Kurdish rebels in northern Iraq to weaken, weaken uh, the Iraqi government, which at the time was seen as too close to the Soviet Union. Uh, but again, and these weapons came in through Iran, the Shah and, and Washington uh, didn't want to see the Kurds create a state of their own, which was their intention, uh, and then sold them out. 1975 with the Algiers Agreement, where you saw uh, Iran and Iraq settle their border disputes, uh, and that uh, immediately severed military support for the Kurds, saw the Iraqis launch a very ruthless campaign of eth ethnic cleansing in northern Iraq. Thousands of Kurds, including women and children, were disappeared, disappeared or killed. Kurdish villages were dynamited into rubble. And then Henry Kissinger, when asked about it, made that famous quote that covert action should not be confused with missionary work. Once the 1979 revolution happened in Iran, uh, the Kurds were uh, useful again. Uh, and so uh, uh, you saw military aid resumed uh, to the Kurds uh, by Iran uh, during uh, the war between Iran and Iraq, 1980-1988. Uh, and then the war ended in 88, uh, and uh, the, our supposed allies, we had now become allied with, we, we were allied with uh, Iraq during the war with Iran. Uh, it, that's when Saddam Hussein dropped mustard gas and nerve agents on Halabja. 5,000 people were killed within minutes, 10,000 were injured. And the Reagan administration uh, essentially covered up, minimized the war crimes uh, that have been committed against its former allies. I mean, that's a classic kind of example, Nixon's rapprochement with China, and another example included terminating covert assistance to the Tibetan rebels. So betrayal is always the closing act of, of proxy wars, and the Ukrainians will be betrayed. Uh, uh, there's a clear understanding that uh, the Ukrainians, number one, can't win a war of attrition, and that uh, the eastern provinces, the Donbass, are not going to go back into Ukrainian hands. There's an understanding of that. I think there's actually even a kind of panic uh, because the longer the war goes on, the more the position of U Ukraine deteriorates. Uh, they just can't, they can't afford to bleed uh, the, the way they are bleeding over uh, a long period of time. And uh, that's why you see every red line by the Biden administration about not sending missiles or now M1 Abrams. Now, of course, they're talking about fighter jets uh, crossed. Uh, the the I, I was in the last tank battle in the war in Iraq with the U.S. Marine Corps in the first Gulf War. Abrams are extremely difficult uh, tanks to operate. Uh, in fact, if you make a mistake on, <laughs> on an Abrams, it can usually be lethal. They also provide, you need, in order to have successful tank uh, action, you need air cover, which the Ukrainians don't have. Uh, and you also need huge support vehicles. They're very temperamental weapons. Um, and I, I think we're only sending, what, 33 or something. But it's almost symbolic in a way. It's a kind of Hail Mary. Uh, but none of this is going to come up in the press. Um, and to attempt to speak about these kinds of details or this kind of history or this kind of context immediately gets you blanked out. Uh, and so uh, that, that the press does, it serves as it did with the war in Iraq as a kind of cheerleader uh, for the war.
uh, it, it does its part. Uh, it keeps its ad revenues. Uh, it makes the uh, the the uh, you know the, the the deep state, if you want to call it that, the intelligence and military entities happy. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, and in the end, uh, you know, this proxy war will close like every other proxy war that I covered. So, uh, but that that kind of discussion you're just not going to hear on on the commercial media uh, because you have a lot of vested interests uh in perpetuating this proxy war uh and they are going to shut out uh those of us who critique this dominant narrative turn on your microphone judy Oh, so sorry. And you were muted. Uh, thank you. Um, so thank you, Chris. And I'm I'm wondering, you know, are you shut out of mainstream media? Do you get invited on MSNBC or CNN or uh, is the New York Times calling you to ask you? Because I'm sure um, folks here have not heard uh, what you're saying. And um, just curious um, where you're allowed, uh, where you're invited to speak. No. I mean, the most egregious example for me was the build up to the war in Iraq. So I had been the Middle East Bureau Chief of the New York Times. As you mentioned, I speak Arabic. I had spent seven years in the Middle East, I, I, months of my life in Iraq. I understood the military fiasco that this would become. Uh, and I could speak with a kind of authority based on many years of experience. Uh, but I was completely blanked out. I was not given a perch on any major news organization uh, because it wasn't a critique or, or I, I would call it more than a critique, an understanding uh, that was palatable to the people who were beating the drums for war. What was so galling to people such as myself was that the people they trotted out as experts on Iraq had never been there. Uh, they didn't speak Arabic. They had not spent significant time or any time in the Middle East. Uh, you know, Tom Friedman being an exception, he did spend some time in the Middle East. Uh, but if you didn't uh, parrot uh, that call for war uh, and and the lies that were used to sustain it, uh, then it, it didn't it didn't matter how much experience you had in the region. You 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 were not given uh, a voice. So that it started early, and of course, I clashed with the New York Times, which asked me well demanded i was a reprimand formal written reprimand to stop speaking about the war in iraq which i wasn't going to accept and left the paper so uh no the, that that you know and that's the kind of again gets into the uh decline or the decay of the u.s media especially public broadcasting uh npr pbs these were designed at the our inception to give a voice to people that weren't representing corporate interests or representing the powerful or coming out of the power elite. I mean, you, you go back to the beginning of PBS, you could actually see figures like Noam Chomsky, Howard Zinn being given a voice, people who, who weren't acting as shills for corporations or for one of the two ruling parties, but that's gone. Uh, and NPR is awful. Uh, I used to work for NPR uh, originally when I first started. I covered the Falkland War for them, and, and I covered a year and a half of the war in El Salvador for them. So uh, there, there's just been a, such an impoverishment within the media, a kind of, uh, you know, it's what uh, what Dorothy Parker said about Katherine Hepburn's emotional range as an actress that went from A to B. Um, that's kind of like where we are, you know, it's do we do we go in, just, do we just bomb uh, Syria or do we put boots on the ground? Like those are the two options for dealing with Syria. I mean, it's just nutty, uh, but that's where we've ended up. So, you know, for those of us who have not sold out, uh, it's, we, we've been completely marginalized. And that's quite distressing because it's very unhealthy uh, for uh, what's left of our very anemic democratic republic. So um, one of the other things we talked about yesterday was the that dealt with the media was the Nord Stream pipeline story. Um, and, you know, maybe you could talk about 
how that's playing out when you, you say, I mean, it seems to have disappeared, but um, uh, as Medea pointed out yesterday, the New York Times in their rebuttal did the same thing that, you know, they're using anonymous sources. So, well, I know how that works, having spent 50 <laughs> years at the New York Times or the NSA, and they gave them anonymous sources and told them it wasn't true, and they ran it. They didn't actually do any reporting. Look, I mean, as Cy Hirsch says correctly, this was a story hiding in plain sight. Uh, we, we know that Victoria Newland and others made very public statements about wanting to destroy it, celebrated the destruction. The New York Times reported that the Russians were seeking bids to repair the pipeline. If they blew it up, why would they, you know, it was a completely, uh, and, and why would they blow it up anyway? It never made any sense for them to blow it up. So, uh, but the, the, it's, it's, it's death by silence. I mean, they, uh, and Sai, who I admire, I mean, he's, and no, and his friend, and, and is really, you know, one of the greatest investigative journalists uh, in the country. Uh, when Sai, exposed the whole lie around the killing of Osama bin Laden, the actual story about how he was killed. Again, he couldn't get it published in the United States, pushed out of the New Yorker. Uh, Remnick and the New Yorker have always been, you know, full partners in the war industry uh, going back to Iraq. Uh, and uh, and again, it was ignored. So they, they ignore it. Um, they, uh, they pretend it doesn't exist. And then they write a short article based on anonymous sources coming out of the security establishment or the military establishment that discredits the story and then they're done. Um, yeah, that, that, that's a classic. And uh, that is the kind of quid pro quo that papers like the New York Times have with the centers of power, because I used to say the real motto of the New York Times is do not significantly access, uh, do, do not significantly damage those upon uh, those who we depend on for access and power, access and power. I mean, you were rewarded, didn't matter how good a reporter you were, you were rewarded at the paper for getting interviews with, uh, you know, major world leaders. And they never said anything, it was the worst part of my job, but they never said anything worth publishing, uh, but it gave the, it, it was about prestige. So that access, it gets, it's, it's absurd on many levels. I mean, I, after 9-11, was based in Paris for the New York Times, and I covered Al-Qaeda. I didn't cover, I, I, so I speak Arabic, Spanish, and French. So I covered Al-Qaeda in the Middle East and Europe, with the exception of Germany, because I don't speak German. Um, and uh, French intelligence was apoplectic that they were going to invade Iraq. So uh, at the highest levels of the French government, I had was given carte blanche, I mean, complete security clearance. I literally would go into the uh in the see the counterterrorism office in the foreign ministry run by this crazy sicilian and uh, not sicilian corsican and um i just asked for files i mean i i covered richard reed shoe bomber i they just brought the files out within a half hour i mean all the photos of him going everything and the reason was that they they understood that the problem was al-qaeda the problem was not the taliban the problem was not saddam hussein and I would fly back to New York and uh, they would, you know, if you remember, there was all this race, racist talk about the French and people renaming French fries, and they're not even called French fries in France, but renaming French fries, freedom fries. I mean, was, so, and the New York Times just dismissed it because they were French. Well, I had hard evidence. And uh, so uh, th that's a kind of uh, classic example of how uh internally the press i mean they would say well you know that's not what lewis scooter libby told us that's not what dick cheney told us that's not what richard pearl showed. well these guys were all lying through their teeth i mean people came, went after judy miller who i can't stand on um, and uh, but uh she was a scapegoat the whole institution was culpable i know because i was on the inside so um yeah it, it it's uh uh, they 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 want that access, and they're willing to act as uh, essentially shills, even when even when you know they're lying, uh, because that access is really important to them. That's also even more true, perhaps, on the cable news shows. So they there's a very there's it's a very cynical game, very cynical. So uh, and that's what they've done to Sai. I mean, Sai. Remember, Sai used to work for the New York Times. He he 
his last story for the Times was on Gulf and Western, uh, which was this big mobbed up uh, corporation. Uh, and uh, But the head of the corporation, Charlie Bluthorn, was a friend of the publisher. I mean, he used to invite the publisher over for private screenings because they owned Paramount Pictures. Um, and they killed, they ruined the story. They destroyed it and Cy quit. And I remember Cy wrote a good memoir called Reporter. He said, I realized then that we could never take on corporate power. We could still take on government power, but it was over. Corporate power would never be. And that now we can't take on government power either. Julian Assange is a good example of what happens when you try that. Whoa, so, you know, you, the story about the lies was pretty public after, you know, many years. What happens to the people that they're willing to swallow the lies again? This is a playbook. It's not, didn't start with Iraq, it, you know, it's Vietnam, it's Korea, it's, it's everything. It's El Salvador. It's, so it's over and over and over. The public has told a story and lied into war. And, you know, earlier you said that we'll be betrayed the Ukrainians, but haven't we already be betrayed them just by saying, you know, we were going to support them? I thought cheese comment to Zelensky was important in that. It's, it's like, you know, there's, there's no support. It's always betrayal. And, um, everybody's eating up the story again. What happens in a mind and a mass here in the United, because the rest of the world isn't believing this. What happens? Do we get so lost? Does mainstream media control minds that fully? Sure, because you speak in cliches. So you speak in easily palatable cliches. We love freedom. We are good people. We defend democracy. Putin is the new Hitler. Now, it's all ridiculous cliches. Business, and you can't counter those cliches because when you begin to speak, as I just spoke, in something that is outside of the dominant narrative and doesn't embrace the cliches, it takes a lot of time. And you're never given time. So you might you might be given four minutes or six minutes if you can even get on, but you you might as well be speaking Greek. Uh, they don't get it, and and that's the problem. And I also want to go back to the press. So all of the people who sold us the war in Iraq are now George Packer, you know, are all selling us the war in Ukraine. Well, they were all wrong about Iraq, all of them, and those of us who were right are still in the wilderness. Why? Because they were, they served the centers of power and they were rewarded for it. I mean, there it, it's careerism. I, I, there was no daylight in terms of my analysis of what was going to happen if we invaded Iraq and every other reporter I knew who covered the Middle East, zero. But they were just smart enough to keep their mouth shut because it was, it was career suicide. I mean, for me, it was personal. I, I had friends. I, I knew they would die. I mean, without being melodramatic, some of them did die. And I thought, how can I sit here and be quiet? I was very conscious of what I was doing. I mean, I knew I was destroying my career, but it, but it was a life and death, death issue for people I cared about. Whatever cost I paid was nothing compared to what Iraqis have paid, Syrians have paid. Afghans have paid. And of course, why I'm so passionate is, and you've done great work on this, on the Palestine issue, because I spent so much of my life in Gaza. And anything I do is nothing compared to what Palestinians in Gaza are suffering. So yeah, the, and the, they're all the same idiots. <laughs> and they're all out there doing it all over again. And, 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 and they're, the press is their echo chamber. So yeah, I think it's, I think it's because of the nature of the press because it, it, it is so superficial. I mean, the press by, you know, I also come out of a long kind of academic training, eight years in a university. I spent four years and four years in graduate school. So I, th there's, you know, an understanding that the press by its nature is superficial. It is, that is true. Um, and, uh, 
And if you never break beyond that superficiality, and most people are passive consumers of news, they don't go and search. Uh, they don't, and of course, no one reads books anymore. You can't understand what's happening in, in, in the Middle East if you don't know what the Sykes-Picot Agreement is. If you, if you don't know the full history of the, of the British mandate in Palestine and, and the IDF and, or Haganah and all that, you don't have to know all that. But you're not gonna get it from the media. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and unless you're proactive, which most people aren't, then you're easily led. I mean, for instance, the, the war on terror. Now, there was a phrase I never used um, because it's a tautology when you break it down. That's why Chomsky is so brilliant. I mean, on so many levels, but partly because he's a linguist. He immediately understands you can't have a war on terror. It any sense. So, but, but even if you're opposed to the quote unquote war on terror and you use that phrase, you're already in some sense captive. That's why I don't have a TV and I'm not on social media. And I read, I try and read every night. I'm reading James Joel's The Second International. That's what I'm reading right now. All the debates <laughs> between the Germans and the French from 1889 to 1914. <laughs> you have to read that stuff. You have to. So, but yes. I think severing ourselves from a print-based uh, culture it, has been very, very devastating. Um, you know, I say my very good friend Cornell, I just had lunch with him in New York. So Cornell West. So, I mean, you know, who always makes me feel illiterate. Um, uh, but when every time Cornell and I sit down, it's, like four or five hours solely about books. Also, by the way, true with Mumia Abu Jamal. I yes. visit Mumia and it's six hours. The guy's brilliant. And all he does is read. His whole cell is a giant library. And all we do is for six hours talk about books. That's it. Um, and you know, the old radicals read Emma Goldman. And so they're working 12 hours a day in a sweatshop and then they're going off to, to, Yiddish anarchist study groups. You, you, we need that. We need to recover that component of education because the mass culture is not only not giving it to us, but doing everything it can to destroy it. And we're never going to break free from that domination. Uh, and Gramsci, of course, writes about this, this cultural hegemony. We're never going to break free from it unless we do the hard work ourselves. And I think that that seduction of these electronic hallucinations that I, I had, I did an event with Noam a couple of years ago and I pulled out my phone and Noam's comment was, I can't believe you have one of those things. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, you know, in a recent piece you wrote, The Lords of Chaos, um, one of the things you talk about is the the lack of responsibility. I mean, you've talked about the lying, but there's no responsibility um, for the lying, for their crimes, and we're we're living inside of that um, devastation. Um, but nobody talks about it, so nobody is really understanding the cost the cost to themselves, which is extreme. It's kind of and you know, and it's it's in the same way, people who live in the United States have been betrayed. Yeah, they have, but you know, of course, as you well know, Jody, the cost uh, to the betrayed abroad is far graver than our betrayal. Yes, we have been betrayed, uh, but we have extinguished the lives of millions. Uh, and uh, I mean, people talk about NATO. I mean, that's another cliche. NATO is a defensive organization. I said, try running that line in Iraq. <laughs> uh, I mean, or it's- Bo Or Bosnia or, yeah. Right, right, I mean, so that, and I think, you know, having spent 20 years on the outer reaches of empire and watching the, the horror that empire is and, and having seen the lives of people I care about extinguished, uh, but, but again, this is not uh, registered uh, within the American public and the, and the media is, is uh is of course uh culpable uh so just the whole 
constant uh, call for the escalation of the war in uh, Ukraine. For those of us who've spent a lot of time in war, it's just nauseating and sickening because we understand the human cost. You don't see the human cost. So I covered, I was in Sarajevo during the war in Bosnia. The city was being hit with uh, hundreds, three, 400 shells a day, constant sniper fire, four to five, six people a day were dying. Dozens of people were wounded a day. When I got there, 45 foreign reporters already been killed. So the, the Serbs were lobbing in heavy stuff. These were not small mortars. These were 90 millimeter tank rounds, Katusha rockets, um, uh, you know, the equivalent of Soviet equivalent of 155 howitzers, really big stuff. And, and they, there was no running water throughout the city. Um, so you had to go to collection points and the Serbs knew where they were and they would target them. So these shells would come in uh, and uh, people's bodies were just blown in half. I mean, legs blown off. It was awful. Um, and and the images, if you actually saw those images, I mean, there was certainly the capacity to transmit those images. They were never transmitted. You would transmit, however disturbing those images are, was all around the edges. So nobody ever sees the war, uh, except for the people who are there. That's number one. And then in the case of our own conflicts, like Iraq, especially if you're embedded, well, well most of them are embedded, uh, you can't, you don't report, you, you, you're you you're in the uh, military unit that is perpetrating the fire. You, you don't, the victims are, are never seen. You don't see them. And then if you are embedded, I never embedded, but, but the, I have friends who did, and if, for instance, an Iraqi family, if you're embedded with a unit, an Iraqi family ran a roadblock and uh, either because it was dark or they drove too fast or they didn't understand the command to stop and everybody in the car is killed, including the children, you don't report it because if you report it, you're instantly unembedded. So it's the lie of omission. We don't see what, what we do. We don't, we don't see it. We don't know. And I mean, that's why I love the stuff you and Medea and others do because you go there <laughs> because you got to see it, uh, you know, whether it's in Gaza or anywhere else. So yeah, the, 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 we live, you're right. Most of the world gets it. Uh, and because a huge percentage of the world are our victims, everybody in the Middle East gets it. We don't get it. And it gives us a very warped perception of who we are and how we are viewed. Yeah. Uh, which so, is part of what makes us swallow that we're told we're told we're good by you know supporting war. Well, look, I mean, I listened to Bobby Kennedy's announcement. Well, first of all, he said he wouldn't lie to us, but you know, we are a good people, and this kind of deification of the framers of the Constitution. I mean, it's just again this a willful historical amnesia. I know it plays to voters. I guess that's why he did it. Look, the framers of the Constitution were awful people. They were white uh, male slaveholders who hated and did everything they could to build in mechanisms to prevent direct democracy. And, and the radicals of the revolution, like Thomas Paine, they immediately disowned. When Paine died, there were six people at his funeral, four of whom were black. He was an abolitionist. And he was a socialist in essence. He was came out of the kind of it was the kind of chartist tradition. But he was, yeah, he he and and that had tremendous appeal. I mean, he was, uh, I think his, uh, you know, appeal to reason and rights. I mean, this stuff was the most heavily read tracks or books of of, uh, of the era, and of course that's what people wanted. Well, that's not what they got. So, yeah, even even the the liberal elite is kind of uh, stoking this myth. I'm, I'm not saying we're bad people, I'm, but we're no different from any other people. It's a mixture of good and bad. We're capable of doing horrible things uh, because we can in the name of empire. I mean, I covered many, many conflicts and, and uh, you know, power is a dangerous thing. I mean, for the war in Kosovo would be a good example. I, I spent all my time covering uh, atrocities carried out by the Serbs against the ethnic Albanians. 
Well, the moments the Serbs withdrew, I mean, literally within 24 hours, all I was writing about were the atrocities committed against ethnic Serbs by the Albanians. Well, that's the job of a journalist, to give a voice to those who are being crushed by the centers of power, whoever wields those centers of power. Uh, so, yeah, it's very hard to puncture that, that lie, uh, almost impossible, because, of course, it's also, you know, perpetuated in the entertainment industry, uh, you know, through, with maybe the exception of Oliver Stone, <laughs> through just about anybody who makes a film. Uh, and, uh, you know, Saving Private Ryan and all this kind of stuff. Uh, it's really impossible. And veterans who come back and attempt to speak the truth, who are already kind of traumatized and alienated anyway, usually give up because nobody wants to hear it. And the reason they don't want to hear it is because it challenges their own conception of themselves. It would forces them to ask very difficult questions that they don't want to ask. Uh, and so it's easier to shut the truth out. And that's been true, you know, in every war. Uh, that, that that was true after World War Two. I mean, you had the guys who put up the flag at Iwo Jima. They couldn't cope uh, because nobody wanted to hear it. I mean, Hayes drank himself to death. Another guy committed suicide. So, uh, you know, that's so well. The famous story of uh, wounded Marines in a hospital, I think in Hawaii, and John Wayne comes in, and they, they even though many of them can't get out of their bed, they throw their bedpans at, at him and drive him out. So, um, Jim, I wanted to invite you in to ask a question. I know I've been monopolizing, but I'm <laughs> quite all right. <laughs> Hello, Chris. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for your your deep analysis. And what I would like to do is uh, broaden this uh, conversation because I think the line of questioning that Jody's been pursuing is 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 really a, a portal to a deeper malaise in US and I would say Western society uh, that you spoke so uh, poignantly about in your book, America, uh, A Farewell Tour, which I just found uh, profoundly illuminating and also moving. Uh, and I noted uh, uh, a blog that you did just a couple of days ago called The United States of Paralysis. And I would love to have you um, talk about the themes that you address in in your book, you know, the farewell tour, and also this notion of the United States of paralysis, because what's going on in the in the media, as you have laid out, is part and parcel of a deeper malaise, as social bonds are being cut, as corporate power uh, increases. And therefore, uh, in some ways, there's an emerging death wish that gets played out in Ukraine, but it also gets played out in the mass shootings and in a variety of other areas uh, because US, uh, the U.S. Imperium is at a point of dramatic decline. And therefore, there's a certain rot in the entire system that we also need to understand that you've been pointing out uh, for some time. Right, well, this comes out of Emile Durkheim, the French sociologist, and that was the kind of impetus for me to write the book that you just mentioned, America, the Farewell Tour. So Durkheim, I think it was 1898, decides to look at suicide uh, throughout France and try and see if he can determine the common factors that lead people to, or lead people or groups to commit acts of self-annihilation. And what he came up with was, that's where we get the term anime, are these social bonds, those bonds that knit you to a society. Work is extremely important, of course. Uh, and, and I'm no fan of John Paul II, uh, who really made war on Catholics with a social conscience. I was in Latin America at the time. Uh, but he did write a very good encyclical about work. Uh, and he was right that it, that 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 without that sense of place, that sense of meritocracy, the dignity, the ability to sustain yourself and your family, uh, to have a recognizable place within community, you strip that away. Uh, and then uh, people fall into what's popularly called diseases of despair, which are inflicting the country, uh, whether that's 
the opioid crisis, morbid obesity, sexual sadism, I'm written quite strongly against porn, uh, hate groups. I mean, Durkheim says that those who seek the annihilation of others uh, have, are driven by longings for self-annihilation. You see that in the mass shootings, which almost always end in either suicide or suicide by cop. Uh, so uh, this book that I wrote really took off from that point and examined those communities that were convulsed by these diseases of despair, heroin addicts, and I was with the three percenters and the Proud Boys, uh, suicide. Uh, I went to kink.com, which was at the time housed in the former San Francisco Armory, it was apparently the world's largest BDSM online. You could call in and you could, you could get people, women waterboarded if you paid enough money to watch. I mean, it's just sick. So uh, all that's what happens when societies break down. And I wrote a book on the Christian right about a decade ago called, maybe more than a decade ago, called American Fascists, the Christian Right and the War in America. And uh, I went, I come out of the liberal church, as, as you said, or Jody said, I'm a Presbyterian minister. My father was a minister. My mother was a seminary graduate. Um, so I'm hardly hostile to uh, religious traditions and religious beliefs, but I come out of that left wing of the church, the Barrigans and Dorothy Day and all this kind of stuff. The, what was known as the social gospel under Rausch and Bush. And um, so uh, I went in there with the prejudices uh, that I think those of us, the educated elites carry, but you couldn't listen to the stories that these people told without having your heart break. Uh, just horrific stories. I'm talking about the followers in these mega churches, people, <clears throat> the kind of people you would have seen on January 6th. You know, evictions, domestic abuse, sexual abuse, uh, struggles with alcoholism, uh, drugs, uh, domestic violence. I mean, just horrific, you know, and constant economic instability. Uh, and, and by the end of that book, I came to a kind of conclusion that the only way to break the back of this neo-fascist movement, this Christian fascism, uh, is to reintegrate these people into society. Uh, and of course, co this is antithetical to everything that corporate uh, culture uh, uh, promotes. Uh, you And I wrote a book called Empire of Illusion, The End of Literacy and the Triumph of Spectacle, where I actually begin the book with professional wrestling as a kind of template for America. I mean, it was pre-Donald Trump. Um, and, uh, and if you look at the way Trump handles his publicity, it's straight out of uh, professional uh, wrestling. But, but capitalism is antithetical to all of this. It, 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 its core attributes, uh, you know, about relationships that are transactional and usually temporary, uh, prioritizing self-advancement through manipulation and exploitation, uh, the insatiable lust for fame, power, wealth, all of these, you know, dark uh, virtues, if you want to call them that, or dark ethic is uh, the staple of any reality television show. It's what we're taught. I mean, Trump is kind of the personification of 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 the disease. He, he he's what we're all told we're supposed to uh, strive to become. Uh, you know, he's kind of a walking advertisement for the call to the self. So th that that uh, the 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 disease of society. And Durkheim said, you know, no society uh, is. Uh, uh, can be diseased without uh, those uh, who are involved in the life of that society inevitably uh, uh, adopting that sickness as their own. And, uh, and that's right. Uh, and, and we're not going to stop the rise. I mean, we're now watching, you know, it's what, 18 months away, so things can change, but it appears we're going to watch uh, replay of uh, the last election uh, where it's Trump and Biden. Uh, and we're not going to stop uh, the rise of Trump or a Trump-like figure uh, by censoring him or censoring this group or locking up all the people who participated in the January 6th incursion of the Capitol. It isn't going to work in until we address the root causes of our, uh, you know, of our deformed society. Uh, which is, of course, the rupture of these social bonds. 
until those are re-knit, we're doomed. Uh, and, and you read, I, I don't, you know, it's always <clears throat> kind of tricky to draw historical parallels, but if you look at Weimar, it's much the same, and all the writer, good writers on totalitarianism, Hannah Arendt and others, Betelheim, and they all make that point. It was also true in Yugoslavia. People forget the war in Yugoslavia was caused not by ancient ethnic hatreds, but by the economic collapse of Yugoslavia, hyperinflation, all. And it's largely because of Tito, when they gave the West, Tito was a buffer state. He was hostile to Moscow. And they gave him all sorts of loans they knew Yugoslavia could never repay uh, because they wanted to keep the Yugoslavs happy and on their side. And, uh, and then uh, after the Cold War uh, and after Tito died, they, they, they wanted those loans paid and they couldn't get any more. So the huge state enterprises collapsed, massive unemployment. And, uh, and suddenly people retreated into these mythic identities. I was in Montgomery a couple of years ago with the great civil rights attorney, Brian Stevenson. We were walking through the streets of Montgomery, half of Montgomery's black. And uh, he was pointed out all the Confederate memorials that had been put throughout the city, including when you drive into Montgomery, there's this gigantic Confederate, was a couple of years ago, giant Confederate flag. Uh, flying, I mean, and uh, outside the city, and and I said to Brian, well, that's exactly what happened in Yugoslavia, uh, and, and that's what we're seeing. That when you uh, strip away uh, a- any sense of <clears throat> place or meaning, <clears throat> you will retreat inevitably into these mythic identities, uh, buttressed by uh, disenfranchised, or or uh, it, it's kind of buttressed by white supremacy among a disenfranchised white. Uh, working class. So that's the problem. And uh, that's not the problem we're addressing. Uh, the, the liberals want to, you know, uh, censor Trump or censor this group or that group. Uh, I mean, everybody's culpable. You know, they have their bizarre conspiracy theories like QAnon. Uh, we have ours, Russiagate. Uh, and, and, and it's frightening because nobody is tackling the reality that's around us, a reality mm-hmm. that is probably, unless it's dealt with, very swiftly going to snuff out what's left of our very anemic democracy. Because if Trump or any of these doppelgangers, Marjorie Taylor Greene or DeSantis, it doesn't really matter. When they come back in, they're going to come in with a kind of vengeance. Mm. Uh, it's going to be really, really frightening. Uh, and, and, and Biden and the Democrats are culpable um, because uh, they, and that's the whole, this column you mentioned, the United States of Paralysis, They've stood by and done nothing virtually. I mean, even the very uh, tepid uh, promises that were made by the Democrats in the last election, raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Remember, they were going to hand everybody $2,000 stimulus checks, his America's jobs plan that would create millions of good paying jobs. Uh, He would strengthen collective bargaining, which immediately when the railroad freight workers tried to uh, bargain. He took away their right. I mean, he could do it legally under the Railroad Act, but uh, he was going to start uh, universal pre-kindergarten and universal paid family leave and medical leave and free community college and uh, would promote a publicly funded option for health care and he wouldn't drill on federal lands. It was all a lie. So, uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're lies. I mean, no less than the lies that Trump these kind of fantasy driven lies of Trump there's still lies. And, and that, that is, I think for those of us, especially who covered situations like Yugoslavia, very, very frightening. And, you know, I'm often accused of kind of being bleak. I said, I don't make it up. You know, I, it's not like I like it. Uh, I want to stop it. Uh, but we live in a society that doesn't even recognize. Well, let's just probe that a little bit more deeply, because uh, I think what you're saying, uh, particularly with analogies to the Weimar Republic, is is very sobering for particularly progressive uh, Americans uh, to take in, because I think uh, what we saw with the last election where the Democrats rallied and prevented the Republicans from uh, taking the Senate uh, and there was this feeling that you know, there was a, a, at least at a minimal level, a, a, a revitalization and a possibility of of moving forward. Uh, we're now seeing uh, 
uh, how extensively and pervasively the the malaise that you're talking about has spread from Trump to the entire Republican Party uh, and the Christian uh, right. So uh, knowing that there's an election coming up in 2024, which many people are are calling uh, absolutely crucial, uh, because if the Republicans do take uh, the Senate and do take uh, the White House, uh, that would mean that democracy is essentially over uh, in the United States. So I'd love to have your sense and analysis of the currents that are coming into play uh, in November of 2024. And given the fact that you're saying that the solution is to solve the underlying problems, there's nobody that I know of anywhere in Washington that's even talking about that, let alone with a, uh, a comprehensive uh, plan. Everyone seems to be subsumed into, you know, the war machine uh, focused on Ukraine and uh, escalating tensions with China and so forth. So within this kind of fulcrum, what where is there room for real movement, or are we so advanced in the decay uh, that there's actually not much anyone can do? Well, I would first say we don't live in a democracy, not a functioning democracy. Uh, the, you know, this is part of the research that Gillens and Page did. Uh, the political system where from their data they said that the economic elites and organized groups representing business interests uh, have primary impact on determining U.S. government policy, mass-based interest groups and average citizens, and these are their words, have little or no independent influence. So we live in a system with the political philosopher Sheldon Woolen called inverted totalitarianism. Um, and uh, you can get a good explanation of that in his book, Democracy Incorporated. Uh, but in essence, it's, it's a corporate coup d'etat. It's over. The Democrats are as subservient to corporate power and the war industry, as you mentioned, uh, as the Republicans. In fact, you get now more opposition to the permanent war economy and Ukraine from the fringe elements of the Republican Party than you do from uh, the Democrats. So uh, I was a very early supporter of Ralph Nader, in fact, and ended up becoming a speechwriter um, because I bought Ralph's argument that, that power is a, a game of uh, fear, a game of pressure, uh, and that if he could pull 10, 15 million people out of the Democratic Party to support a third party movement, and the history of third party movements in the United States, they almost never take power, uh, but they force, like the Progressive Party, Eugene V. Debs, they pressure the centers of power to respond. It was also true under Bismarck, by the way. Bismarck was terrified of the socialists. And so you got uh, eight hour workday and pensions and, and it was all given by Bismarck, who's a pretty retrograde figure, but he was terrified of, that the socialists were gonna take control. That's how you, you have to pit power against power. Now, it didn't work. Uh, and and uh, for a variety of reasons, and largely the Demo it was the Democratic Party that destroyed Nader's candidacies. Um, and uh, and so, you know, every election cycle, things have gotten worse and worse. I mean, Biden's record is just appalling uh, and 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 uh, and kind of indefensible. Uh, it, it's uh, he and I, as Jody said, you know, I. I teach in a prison. Um, most of my students wouldn't be there but for Biden. Uh, this is a guy who pushed through the 94 omnibus crime bill, militarized mm -hmm. police, 100, it was 100, I can't remember the price tag, but you know, built all sorts of new prisons, uh, virtually double the prison population, 2.23 uh, million. It's the largest prison population in the world, sentences two, three, four times longer, 40% of the people in our prison population. Are, have never been convicted of physically harming another person. I mean, this is nuts. We interview it's on the phone this morning to one of my students who's out, is going to graduate. I'm going to his graduation next week from Rutgers, graduating summa cum laude, was uh, imprisoned at 17. I, I've taught students that were imprisoned as adults at 14. So he gave us NAFTA. He gave us the Patriot Act. 
uh, he supported the Glass-Steagall, the destruction of Glass-Steagall. Uh, I mean, he did a lot of damage, uh, not to mention the fact that he was anti-abortion, uh, allied with it. And the reason Obama picked him is because his voting record was Republican. And, and of course, again, it's all going to be driven by fear, uh, fear of Trump. I don't think it's going to work. I, I'm not a good prognosticator. I mean, I, I found that out when Carter ran against Reagan, and I was sure Carter would win because how could anybody vote for Ronald Reagan, which shows you how much I know. Um, okay, I was living in Cambridge, Massachusetts at the time. But uh, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, um, we're, we're doomed either way. And, 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 you know, unless we, and I think Shama Sawan, the socialist city councilwoman uh, who from Seattle who's not running again, has got it. We have to rebuild those militant union movements, you know, the old Wobblies and the CIO, and, uh, because the only weapon the working class has at this point is the strike. I mean, that, that's what got Netanyahu to back off, at least temporarily, yeah, yeah, yeah. destroying the judicial system. It's not, you know, Macron has kind of uh, ignored it. Uh, I love the French and I've lived in Paris, lived in France. Uh, you know, I was in Paris once when there was some dispute with the farmers and they all drove their tractors in the centers of Paris and shut the city down. I mean, that's kind of what you have to do. Uh, but again, that gets into the whole assault on organized labor, only about 10%, 11% U.S. workforce is organized. Um, I think Shama's got onto something. I think we have to uh, rebuild a militant labor movement that, that has the capacity to carry out strikes because that is the weapon we have to cripple the ruling elite. It's why I also support Extinction Rebellion because uh, mm -hmm. closing the motorways all around London. And that's why the UK has gone so hard after organizers like Roger Hollum. Roger Hollum was put in, he was one of the co-founders of Extinction Rebellion. He just came out of jail, four months in jail for going on a Zoom meeting, calling for the peaceful, nonviolent blocking of highways. That's what they put him in jail for. So they know, I mean, the elites know, and that's what scares them. So I would say, I don't, I never give up hope. Uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. I never give up hope. I always fight back, but we can't fight back by embracing a kind of Pollyannish view of what the world yeah, around us. We have to make a very sober assessment of the world around us and how, and we have to understand how power works. And it doesn't work, you know, I'm going to take it away from Bill McKibben, who's done great work, but, you know, he, he, he gets protesters on a weekend to surround the White House when Obama's president chanting, were your supporters? Well, Obama served the interests of Chevron and BP and ExxonMobil, you know, as assiduously as every other president. You can't vote against these corporate interests, no matter who's in power. You cannot vote against the interests of Goldman Sachs, no matter whether it's Trump or Obama or mm -hmm. Bush, no matter. So we have to stop relying on the political system and we have to start disrupting the political system. And the only weapon that we have is organized mass labor, militant, organized mass labor that is willing to carry out strikes that will paralyze the centers of power. Then they'll respond. Till that moment happens, they are going to continue to do what they do, which is essentially transform the United States into a very naked authoritarian police state. I mean, wholesale surveillance all the tools, Biden again was an architect of this. Uh, we have given the, uh, whoever takes power, the tools uh, to with mm -hmm. a, almost the flick of a switch, create an authoritarian state. And the Democrats are guilty of this. Uh, but you know, this whole, remember that campaign a few years ago to write your congressman to get money out of politics? It was laughable. I mean, these people wouldn't be there, but for corporate money, Who, who's gonna put Schumer and Pelosi in power? Uh, nobody. And they, they know that. I mean, the power of, of, of Schumer, or it used to be Pelosi, I don't know what kind of power she wields now, was that they were the funnel, they were the spigot. And it's how they domesticated AOC and everyone else. Mm -hmm. And uh, they weren't about to get money out of politics, they wouldn't be in politics. Uh, so again, that was for me a misreading of power, and how power works. But 
yeah, I, I'm hopeful that we will refine, regain that militancy, which was very much a part of the American DNA on the eve of World War One, and and resurrected with the breakdown of capitalism in the 1930s. I mean, there's a famous letter that Roosevelt wrote to his brother, where he said, "We have to give them something now because otherwise we will have revolution." That those are Roosevelt's words. Roosevelt again, an oligarch, you know, and maybe a more enlightened oligarch, but he responded to pressure. And that's always been true throughout human history. Mm -hmm. And we mm -hmm. have to regain the mechanism we have to put pressure on the corporate state. And the, the, the primary mechanism that we have is the strike through militant labor. Well, and one thinks of what just happened in Israel where you know 20 percent of the entire population came out on the streets and they started to strike and it was at that moment that netanyahu backed off at least temporarily well you know it was actually when Histarut, the the, the labor yeah umbrella labor group threatened a national strike that's yeah. when Netanyahu backed off yeah well chris I mean, let me I, just... you know I, you know i'm often attacked for because i'm a supporter of BDS and all that. But actually, in all my years overseas, the closest friends that I made were Israeli because uh, they, they were completely combative, completely blunt. They told you right to your face what they thought. Um, now, they were left-wing Israelis, you know, Amir Haas and these great, I mean, just talk about courage. I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, Gideon Levy, I mean, these are remarkable people. Um, but they have that. I liked it. I mean, I thought it was I had, I had very, very close Israeli friends. I mean, and the other irony is that, you know, that that, that critique is actually far more palatable in Israel. Uh, and, and Netanyahu has moved the country, you know, to its own kind of quasi fascism. But uh, there was far more room for critique in Israeli society than there is in American society. I mean, that's the other thing I found living in Israel is it's kind of amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was there for a year at the University of Tel Aviv, and I would agree with you. And, uh, I, Chris, studied, uh, just... I studied Arabic at the at Hebrew University. Yeah, yeah, I was at the University of Tel Aviv. Yeah. Interesting. Let, Chris, let me open up just a final domain um, for our conversation, and that is the growing escalation of tensions with China and confrontations as the United States takes on both Russia in Ukraine and China in Asia. Uh, it was pointed out yesterday, uh, you know, we got 250 bases in Asia encircling China, but also simultaneously, China, Russia, India, Iran, Saudi Arabia, uh, Brazil are forming the beginnings of a, a coalition uh, that may be not the right word, uh, that is uh, really assaulting the primacy of the U.S. dollar and beginning a shift of the center of gravity in geostrategic global affairs away from uh, U.S. primacy uh, to a multipolar world. Because I think that's a, a, the larger context within which the uh, uh, demise of the United States is is uh, being experienced globally. It's simultaneously, and I think Ukraine has really been a triggering mecha mechanism um, for the rise of a multipolarity that is both challenging the United States, but also hastening the demise of American primacy. So we'd love to have your comments on the global nature of uh, the transition as I would say, uh, using a Chinese term, the mandate of heaven is leaving the U.S. for China uh, and a, a whole different way of looking at, at human affairs. And I, I raise this because, Jody, I think that tweet <laughs> from Xi Jinping um, really encapsulates at the essence of a completely different way of understanding how world affairs uh, can be uh, transacted in a world in which given climate change and myriad of other challenges, we have to be cooperating, not fighting each other and escalating toward nuclear war. So Chris, what would you, what would be your comment on this? 
Well, I think Alfred McCoy has done probably the best work on this. Um, that's his book. I have it up there somewhere. Uh, um, but yes, the, the, the creation of a multipolar world and more importantly, the, the ability of that multipolar world to severance themselves from the tyranny of the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency, as McCoy points out, will be devastating to the empire because yeah. nobody, number one, will want to buy our debt. And number two, the value of the dollar will plummet. And we know exactly what it's going to look like because it's what happened to Britain in the 1950s when the pound sterling was dropped as the world's reserves currency. So that that is McCoy actually courageously, I would never do that, gives a date, 2030, uh, but it, that it's coming and that they're working hard uh, to ensure that it's coming is clear. Uh, and uh, and uh, that will have tremendous social and economic effects within the United States. It will thrust us into a very deep and prolonged depression. Um, uh, and, and, and sustenance, because it's done through debt of the 750 military bases we have abroad, will become impossible. Um, the empire will not be, we won't be able to fund the empire. So, and it will create civil unrest. I mean, there will be an uptick of, if you can believe it, the kind of nihilistic violence that plagues the country. Um, you know, unfortunately, the radical left in the United States has been so decimated. I mean, we could have gone fascist in the 1930s. Lots of countries did, uh, but we had powerful, everybody writes the communists out of our history, but we had powerful militant movements that saved us. They're not mm -hmm. there anymore. And that's very worrying. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, and that always empowers fascist or fascistic elements. And the ruling elite in the United States, uh, Henry Ford and all these people, they were huge admirers, particularly of Mussolini, because he broke the Union. So that's there. Uh, and uh, uh, China, well, I mean, China's the real prize, I mean, for in the eyes of the warmongers. Um, and, and again, that is a characteristic of late empires. So empires at their inception are very judicious about the use of force, actually, very careful about it. Uh, and, uh, and then in decline, mm -hmm. they, my historians call it micro-militarism, they're constantly carrying out military fiascos in a kind of desperate effort to regain that lost hegemony. Uh, if you go back to Vietnam, I mean, do we really count Grenada or, you know, pushing Iraq out of Kuwait as huge military victories? I mean, you can if you want, but pretty much since Vietnam, it's just been one military debacle after another, including 20 years of military debacles in the Middle East. Uh, and, uh, and that accelerates the decline, partly because, of course, you're fueling or, or taking resources from the state for a war machine. Uh, while our roads, bridges, schools, electrical grids crumble and 600,000 people are homeless and uh, what is it, nine, I can't remember how many families, nine million children go to bed hungry, etc. Uh, so, uh, and then instead of responding, because you're only investing in systems of control, you're not actually investing in people, the way you respond is to take the very harsh forms of control on the outer reaches of empire and bring them back to the homeland militarized drones, militarized police, uh, revoking habeas corpus, uh, uh, vast prison systems, etc. Wholesale surveillance of the public. We're the most spied upon, watched, monitored, photographed population in human history. I mean, we have outdone even the Stasi state, which I covered. So uh, that uh, antagonism with China, it does two things. It is again, uh, kind of quixotic and self-defeating attempt to regain lost hegemony. Uh, China will quickly overtake us economically, I think already has in terms of industrial output. Uh, uh, so you're trying to regain that lost hegemony. And then also you need to justify the, uh, the diversion of huge amounts of state resources into the war machine. So you have to, you can't do that unless you have an enemy. I think the reason uh, the, you know, if we, people forget that again, you know, having been in Eastern Europe in 89, that, that Gorbachev, Yeltsin, and in the beginning, Putin, 
all wanted to build both economic and security alliances with the West and the U.S. Exactly. You get that. Exactly. Well, you can't justify the expansion of NATO unless Russia's made an enemy. If they don't want to become an enemy, then we'll make them the enemy. That's really what happened. And that's why Putin has such deep and legitimate uh, anger and betrayal, because that was not the intention. They really wanted to be integrated. But the war machine wasn't about to integrate them because you couldn't justify expanding NATO to 14 countries in Eastern and Central Europe. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, and now to China. Now they've like decided that now China. <laughs> yeah. So what are we doing with China? I mean, sending, building nuclear <laughs> submarine bases in Australia. I think Australia is China's one of the largest trading partners. I mean, it's just crazy. Uh, but the war machine has its own self-defeating logic uh, and, and it won't be stopped. And uh, I mean, they, we can't even audit these people. Uh, and it doesn't matter how many disasters they orchestrate. And that's part of the problem with the press because all the cheerleaders for every disaster military fiasco that we've undergone pop up again. And all the kind of shills for the war industry, the Kagans and Elliot Abrams and Crystal. I've dealt with these people since Central America. Robert Kagan worked for Elliot Abrams in the State Department overseeing Central America. And, and I, I, his job, their job was, in essence, to dis attempt to discredit everything we on reporters, we as reporters and photographers were documenting, everything. And they've never changed. And their think tanks, Brookings and American enterprise, and they're all funded. Look, they're all funded by the war industry. And they're all given prominent purchase, even though they've been wrong on everything. It doesn't matter. Mm. Uh, so it's, you know, in essence, having once been part of the mainstream. And so, so I understand how it works. And then, you know, sort of kind of now standing on the sidelines, it's truly terrifying. And having dealt you know, with these people yeah. for decades. I know who they are. I, mean, I know some of them. I know who they are. And they're they're cynical, shallow, not very bright. You know, they're creatures of Washington. They don't understand the world. They're, they don't understand other culture. They're linguistically, culturally, historically, religiously illiterate. Uh, you know, for them, it's all in the paradigm of Munich and World War Two and the new hit Hitler, which is just infantile. Uh, but they run they're running the show. And uh, and it doesn't matter whether it's Republican or Democrat. I mean, Victoria Nuland began as Cheney's uh, when he was vice president, his chief foreign policy advisor. She's working for Biden. I mean, Biden's no different. Biden's awful on all this stuff. Biden was calling for the invasion of Iraq five years before we invaded Iraq. He's totally a creature of of this, which is why he was anointed and appointed. But, but you know, we could be, we could pay a very, we may very soon pay a very steep price for this idiocy. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank unless we so bring this to a close, I'm sorry, Jody. I just was, thank you so much, Chris, because oh, sure. uh, I know you're not reading the chat, but there's <laughs> super celebration of your clarity. I, you know, I, I talk about how we all need to become tuning forks for peace, and you are a tuning fork for sanity, peace, humanity, and um, deepest gratitude that you could join us. Well, everybody, can, as you said, can get everything, including the Real News weekly interview on chrishedges.substack.com. So uh, that's where you can find it now. And thank God for Substack, because they shut down RT at a show. I never did a show in Russia, nothing, zero. Uh, I, I I did shows with, you know, Medea Benjamin and uh, Noam Chomsky and Cornell West, and but they don't want that. that you know, YouTube disappeared the entire archive, uh, and I don't know under what rules they disappeared it because I didn't violate any. I was, show was frankly kind of wonky and boring. Uh, it was mostly writers. McCoy was on there, all sorts of people, the kind of stuff that should be on PBS at about one in the morning with some old writer interviewing other writers. Uh, but again, it's kind of the tragedy of 
what's happened uh, culturally and what's happened within the press. But look, I, I love Code Pink. I think you guys are great. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I admire so much of what you do and you give us all hope. And, uh, you know, people like me feel we're not alone. So thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. And yes, the, um, it's Substack. And Chris is also on The Real News. He has a show once a week. Um, so please, the nourishment that you have just received is there for you every week. I turn to him every week to be nourished, heart, spirit, and soul. So thank you, Chris, so much for this ring of truth and ring of humanity and ring of sanity. And Jim, thanks for um, this opportunity this week to teach. We'll see you all tomorrow. Okay. Yes, thank you. Good day. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, Jody. We hope we can get you back, uh, Chris, because it's the truth that sets a person free in the end. And just knowing the truth is an empowerment that initiates the kinds of courage and changes that you're calling for and that Jody and Code Pink are exemplifying day by day. So I want to really personally and collectively on behalf of our global audience, thank you for your courage in speaking truth to power so consistently over so many years. Uh, it's really a beacon for many of us who track your work. So thank you for being who you are. Well, thanks, Jim. That's sweet. Thank you very much. All right, everyone, that'll bring us to a close for today. You're all welcome to the after session chat. You'll see the link uh, the Stan has put in the uh, chat box and we'll see you then tomorrow uh, for our fourth of five sessions on the situation in Ukraine. And we'll be talking about the possibilities uh, for negotiation and diplomacy. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Jody. Thank you, everyone. See you tomorrow.